Hi, everyone. Welcome to Unconfirmed, the podcast that reveals how the marquee names in crypto are reacting to the week's top headlines and gets the inside scoop on what they see on the horizon. I'm your host, Laura Shin. In response to the challenging times, Crypto.com is waiving the 3.5% credit card fee for all crypto purchases. Download the Crypto.com app today. Today's guest is Stephen Pally, partner at Anderson Kill and chair of the firm's Technology, Media, and Distributed Systems Practice Group. Welcome, Stephen. Hi, how are you doing, Laura? Great. Glad to have you. There's been a lot going on in the area of crypto and law recently. Let's start with the recent spate of class action lawsuits against 42 defendants in 16 countries that all relate to ICOs um, as well as exchanges from 2017. Some of the defendants include Binance, Block One, Bancor, Status, Civic, Tron, BitMEX, etc. Can you summarize what those 11 lawsuits are about? In uh, five seconds or less, yes. So um, <laughs> people lost people lost money due to uh, market fluctuations. And uh, even though the assets are just at issue are um, described in as decentralized or distributed, as one would expect, uh, when people lose money, they try to find uh, other people who are responsible. And that's it in a nutshell, basically. And who are these plaintiffs? I don't know who they are personally. They are um, people who, um, you know, owned uh, crypto, um, and um, so, you know, some of them owned substantial amounts, and they allegedly suffered uh, substantial losses. Uh, they're represented by the same, uh, at least one of the firms that's involved is a firm that uh, represents the plaintiff in a, a lawsuit against Craig uh, Wright in a Florida federal court. And you know there are people who uh, they are. These are what are known as uh, uh, I believe these are filed as putative class actions, which means they uh, hope to represent uh, others who they allege were similarly wronged. And is it just that they lost money? Because you know, if I buy a stock and lose money in the stock, obviously I can't bring a lawsuit. So you know, what is it about the situation here that has that you know that gives them grounds to bring a lawsuit? Uh, well, they claim that there is uh, a culpability, market manipulation, um, that uh, the various defendants um, had a role in uh, causing or contributing assets to uh, their assets, uh, the value of their assets uh, to diminish. And that's it. I'm sort of overgeneralizing, but that's sort of the nubbin of it. And this has always been um, something that people who watch, lawyers who watch this market expected. I, I expect you're going to be asking me about the MakerDAO lawsuit as well. But what we see generally in, in all of the crypto uh, lawsuits is uh, traditional legal principles uh, being applied to newish technology and um, old-fashioned causes of actions and claims, whether uh, federal securities law claims or common law tort claims being applied uh, regardless of the uh, the names or titles given to the the assets in question, or frankly, for that matter, regardless of the location of the defendants, because many of the defendants uh, in the lawsuits that you asked about are actually not in the United States. Yeah, this was something we'll get to that in a moment. But I also wanted to ask, since a lot of the ICOs uh, named in these lawsuits are from 2017, which is, you know, about three years ago, and a lot of them also are from the period before the SEC's Dow report, which was kind of their first foray into the world of ICO. What right. do you why do you think these lawsuits are happening now? Uh, because of uh, recent recent substantial losses, uh, uh, flash crashes, and so forth, the argument uh, there will be like one of the defenses that will be raised absolutely is statute of limitations, right? And so, uh, skimming through the uh, some of the lawsuits, you can see that the plaintiffs are using the uh, SEC the the SEC's digital framework uh, document, which came out, I want to say about a year ago. I don't have the exact date. Maybe it was in May of last year. They're using that as a sort of a threshold uh, date as when um, when it became known, according to the plaintiffs, that many of these things 
were actually securities. Now, whether or not that argument will win the day uh, remains to be seen, but we can certainly expect many of the defendants to argue uh, that these cases or claims uh, were stale, and many of them will argue that, uh, at the very least, people who invested in uh, pre-report uh, ICOs uh, should have known as of the time those reports were issued. Uh, they will also make the plaintiffs will also make arguments that um, uh, the statute of limitations uh, wouldn't apply to uh, exchanges. Uh, particularly in cases where the exchanges were not registered as uh, national exchanges or as broker-dealers and where they were engaged in a continuing sale of the assets at issue. So it's that was a, a long-winded answer, um, which is uh, basically the TLDR is it's complicated. Uh, time is definitely going to be an issue. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me who's going to win. It's a mistake to, on the one hand, say it's a slam dunk uh, for the plaintiffs. It's not. It's a challenge. On the other hand, uh, it would be a mistake to um, to underestimate um, either the merits of the lawsuit, the lawsuits, the resources that these lawyers are bringing to it, or the, the quality of those lawyers. They're, if you look at the, um, the Craig Wright litigation, they're actually, uh, the Roach Friedman firm, with which I'm familiar, they've got skills. So I wouldn't rule out uh, some success. So yeah, before we talk about that law firm, I actually also wanted to dive into the claims against the exchanges. So, you know, I've been asking about the ICOs, but what about the exchanges? What what do these lawsuits tend to say? So I don't actually have the complaints in front of me. I should have done that. Uh, but there are uh, allegations that they were acting um, as unregistered broker-dealers, um, as unregistered exchanges, and as a consequence, uh, were um, acting in violation of um, federal securities laws, that they were selling unregistered securities, um, and in addition to that, that they were uh, that they were perhaps negligent uh, in the way that they uh, maintain their exchanges. So they're, they're, those are some of the claims. So basically, the the, uh, the basic idea is that if you are acting as an exchange, as that term is defined under the uh, Securities Exchange Act of 1934. You have to register unless you're subject to an exemption, or if you are acting if, if you are acting as a broker or a dealer of securities, and the allegation is that uh, these digital assets were securities, you have to register as such. And the failure to do so uh, can expose you to um, fairly significant liability. And you mentioned, uh, you know, about this law firm that it is the same one that's brought suits against Craig Wright and Bitfinex. And I wondered, is there any significance to that about it being the same law firm? Or is it just, you know, they're familiar with this territory? Well, um, they're good lawyers. Uh, They've also, because they have, I mean, the way it works is in uh, law, there's a certain amount of marketing that you do in name building and brand building. So, I don't know how they got their clients, um, but it's certainly possible that, you know, people sent them direct messages on Twitter or emailed them. Someone who lost money uh, might have gone to them and said, hey, I saw what you did in the Craig Wright litigation. Can you represent me? In this case, they might have also done um, some sort of marketing or advertising or outreach. I don't know. But part of it is um, sort of a, a definitely an interest and some expertise in the space. Uh, which um, they've gained through that litigation and another litigation. Uh, some of it would be uh, people recognizing their name because of that involvement. It does happen. Uh, another uh, piece of it is uh, they probably, I don't have any personal knowledge of this, but I'm assuming that uh, they have um, a decent amount, a decent financial cushion. It took uh, a fairly significant amount of time to put those lawsuits together, to write them, People have got to eat and pay rent or mortgages while they do so. And a class action can take years to resolve. The uh, When was the Tezos class action filed? Was that filed initially in 2017? It just settled in, uh, yeah, it settled in uh, 2020 uh, in the spring. I mean, these things take time. Uh, and that didn't even get to class certification. So in order to successfully prosecute a class action, you have to have money. It's an investment because the lawyers aren't being paid hourly, presumably, unless they've got litigation funding or finance. So, 
All right. So in a moment, we'll discuss more of the details about these lawsuits, plus get into the Maker Dow one. But first, a quick word from the sponsors who make this show possible. In response to the challenging times, Crypto.com is introducing three measures to help the community. First, the 3.5% credit card fee for all crypto purchases will be waived for the next three months. Second, you can now get up to 10% back by using the MCO Visa card on food and grocery shopping. Lastly, you could buy gift cards on the Crypto.com app from merchants like Whole Foods, Safeway, Burger King, and more, and get 20% back on food and 10% back on groceries. Download the Crypto.com app today. Back to my conversation with Stephen Pally. So the lawsuits also specifically name some individuals such as Changpeng Zhao, also known as CZ, the CEO of Binance, um, also Brendan Bloomer, the CEO of Block One, BitMEX co-founder and CEO Arthur Hayes, as well as other people. The claims against them are under something called control theory liability. Control person. Control, control person. person liability, yeah. Can you explain more what that means and then whether or not you sure. actually think that applies in these lawsuits? Yeah, so the basic idea, that's uh, it's Section 20. Uh, it's a Section 20A claim uh, under the uh, under the um, Securities Act. Uh, the basic idea is that if you are if you have management control or authority over um, the uh, sale of uh, security uh, or a securities related transaction. Uh, you can have derivative or secondary liability for that. What does that mean? It's it's a way, typically speaking, uh, corporate executives, directors, officers, and employees are typically protected from liability for claims against the corporation by the corporate shield. That's why you form a corporation, right, or an LLC. One of the reasons is uh, for limited liability. Um, under American securities law, someone who uh, who has a control person uh, role um, can be uh, deemed personally responsible or, or personally liable uh, for securities law violations undertaken by uh, the company. So it's a um, you know it's something that I'm involved in litigating now outside of the securities context. Um, yeah, it's real, and yeah, I mean, if do the you company, think that will apply in ahead. these lawsuits? Um, I am sure that they will argue that they don't have control person liability, but you know, a CEO of a corporation, a founder, somebody involved in selling an unregistered security, if that's what it is, uh, this is what a control person liability theory is made for. So yes, I, I, no, I don't think these are trivial arguments. Uh, yes, it's a real thing. Um, and it's sort of the bread and butter of securities litigation. You see these in um, all kinds of securities related lawsuits. So you're saying like essentially there is a possibility that somebody would find that it does apply in this case, but it's not um, a definite, it's not it's a slam dunk. Well, so if the plaintiffs get past um, – What's here's what's going to happen. There will be motions to dismiss. There will be motions to dismiss on jurisdictional grounds. They may raise time as an issue, so statute of limitations may be an issue. And and they're also going to have to serve people overseas via the Hague Convention. All of that procedural stuff is going to take some time. But if they manage to get past that, yes, if they can state a claim against the entities. The claims against the CEOs and founders under a con- uh, Section 20 uh, control person uh, theory, those will remain, and they will have uh, secondary or derivative liability potentially. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. The, the question in the first instance is, the question in the first instance, in order for there to be control person liability, there has to be underlying fault. So you have to, you have to find a fault uh, in something that the business did in the first instance. I, I think that's a correct statement of the law. If not, I'm sure somebody listening will, will post an angry tweet. Uh, but you know, if, without that, without the underlying liability, you don't have the secondary liability or the control person liability. And frankly, the entities are fairly deep pocketed, so you know, it's not like uh, I don't think that there's going to be a collection issue or problem. Hmm. Okay, but one other 
a potential hurdle is the fact that the 11 class action lawsuits span 16 jurisdictions. I know. So how does that work? Like, do you need to work out jurisdiction with with each different jurisdiction? Yep. Is it like case by case or is it a blanket thing yeah. or how how do they assert that? It's possible that I wonder if these lawsuits will be, I guess there's a possibility they'll be consolidated. But the, the answer is um, every defendant uh, is entitled to raise jurisdictional objections and is entitled to, if they're overseas, uh, require a service via in, where it's applicable, the Hague Convention. So, for example, if you sue someone in, let's say you sue a defendant in France, uh, what you'd have to do is uh, you need to get the lawsuit translated into French, and then you typically uh, would have to get it. Um, I haven't done this with France recently. I've done it um, working on something with the UK right now. You have to serve it through something called a central authority, which might be a court. It takes a while. It can take you know several months, six months. In some countries now, because of COVID, central authorities aren't actually working. So that's a, another factor that's going to slow things down. Some courts aren't uh, – you can file lawsuits, but courts aren't issuing a summons, which is a necessary – something you need in order to serve a lawsuit. So I kind of diverged a little bit, um, but the basic answer is it's – every single defendant is going to be allowed to raise their own jurisdictional argument. Hmm. Okay. And it sounds like that will also be how it goes for the actual securities claims that, again, it will be the facts and circumstances of each one. Is that what you think? Or yes. do you think that we'll see kind of like the same judgment across all 11? No. I mean, what could happen is all of these cases can end up being assigned to the same judge or the same set of judges that might make sense because there will be common legal issues. Uh, but look, I mean, they're different, they're different parties. The jurisdictional questions will be addressed with each. So if like, if people remember, I mean, I know you followed this. If you remember the Tezos litigation, there were motions to dismiss that were filed by a variety of defendants and some of the European defendants actually got out. So what was it? A uh, Bitcoin Suisse, I believe they were dismissed. Uh, the other defendants, so um, the foundation, the individual uh, defendants, they remained in. Uh, their their jurisdictional motions uh, were not allowed. So it it's going to be a defendant by defendant inquiry. Each of them will have to be served, and each of them will be able to say, no, there's no jurisdiction over me in New York, right? Right. And oh. sorry, my question wasn't about the jurisdiction, but just about the actual outcome of the case about whether or not oh, securities laws were violated. Sure, sure, sure. So, you know, each of the ICOs was different. Uh, if you're asking whether a decision in one case will be influential in another, you know, my my view is, yes, it will be. If one judge is making these determinations, then how they how they decide on how they decide what civic uh, is and how they decide what um, you know block one is or what it's uh, what that offering was will certainly be influential. You know, they'll also the judge will also look at their recent Telegram ruling, which I know is up on appeal. But yes, I think it will at least be persuasive. So in, in law, we've got – there are two concepts for authority. You've got persuasive authority and you've got binding authority. So it might be persuasive authority for, uh, for what one judge says about one ICO um, with respect to a ruling in another. But the actual finding will not be binding on another case. Hmm. Uh, it wouldn't be what lawyers call um, res judicata or uh, collateral estoppel or so forth. Okay. So we're running out of time, but let's quickly move on sure. to the other big class action lawsuit news in crypto, which is the $28 million case against the Maker Foundation for losses suffered on Black Thursday. Can you summarize what that's about and what the likelihood is uh, that you think it has of succeeding? So um, the allegation is that the Maker Foundation uh, developed and actively promotes the use of a digital currency called DAI. Uh, which it claims is more secure and stable than others because DAI are over-collateralized by other digital currency. And if the value of the collateral drops, Maker Foundation assures investors, then th that triggers a liquidation event where collateral is auctioned off to pay outstanding DAI plus 
uh, liquidation penalty. Otherwise, the uh, holder gets the balance of their collateral back. Uh, and they say that on, on March 12th, 2020, um, which is known as Black Thursday, the value of Ethereum dropped dramatically, triggering mass liquidation events for CDP holders. But instead of triggering actual auctions that would have resulted in minimal or at least mitigated losses for investors, the Maker Foundation's protocol uh, triggered what they call pseudo actions. And two bots continually operated, buying up liquidated CDPs uh, for zero dollar bids. So, in other words, um, despite being promised that auction and over collateralization would mitigate damages against dramatic drops in collateral, they instead lost a hundred percent of their collateral, uh, losing a total of eight point three two five million during the liquidation, which is they say now worth. Over eleven million dollars. That's a summary that I'm taking from the complaint, but that's basically the nuts and bolts of it. I mean, and it sounds. What's interesting is it sounds very much like sort of a traditional, you know, margin liquidation. This sounds like sort of traditional finance, I guess, is what what I'm saying. Even though it's called decentralized, and these things are called CDPs, right? And so, what do you think the likelihood is that this lawsuit will succeed? I don't actually have a good read on it. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm not I'm not going to make a prediction about this one. I guess what I'd say is I personally, like without getting into the merits of what whether Die is going to be successful in the end or whether or not Maker Foundation did a good thing, I was always skeptical that these things were actually decentralized in such a way that uh, the people involved in them couldn't end up having personal liability. Um, so I think it's really interesting to see this decentralized ecosystem thing end up, you know, being directly responsible, according to the complaint, for people losing, you know, more than, according according to the complaint, more than 10 million bucks. And um, instead of it being hard to figure out who to blame for it, you know, there are corporate entities that are named. Right. That to me is the really interesting thing about this. And it also, you know, whatever one thinks of Bitcoin or doesn't think of Bitcoin, it also perhaps shows the wisdom of Satoshi in um, remaining anonymous. You know, the only security against uh, getting sued for problems with digital assets is really for nobody knowing who the heck you are. Um, one other thing that I wanted to ask about the maker lawsuit is something that just was so incredibly fascinating to me, which is that the maker community had a vote on whether or not to compensate victims, and most people were in favor. But there was another part that really caught my attention, which is that they agreed that, quote, to withdraw, vault holders will need to browse to a web page where they agree to indemnify Maker <laughs> and affiliates against any potential legal claims for their loss. Do you think that's enforceable? Um, is it enforceable? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy that all of this decentralization theater and you're getting a traditional and you're somebody's demanding an indemnity. I don't. I don't know. I'd have to read it to tell you whether or not it's enforceable. Um, <laughs> the, the reason why you ask for things like this is because you're you're worried that somebody's going to come after you, right? Um, <laughs> well, so, somebody already did come after them. <laughs> yeah. Right. 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 So it's um, the indemnity is. Would it be contrary to public policy? I don't know. I I, I haven't actually read it, so I'd be. Um, I'd be speculating. It's uh, fascinating to me that someone asked for that, though. Yeah, well, I guess we'll we'll have to see how that plays out. Well, I was going to ask you about the little crypto Twitter storm around your tweet this week, but we're sort of out of time. So I think I'll just have to recommend <laughs> that people read the essay that you wrote or, or the responses to your tweet, uh, which... Most of them seem to all be saying the same thing, which was some variation yeah. of "You're wrong." <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you play on Twitter. Uh, you have to expect people to, uh, you know, say facepalm, boomer, lol. <laughs> um, but that's okay. It's it's um, you know, it sparked a really. I will say this. I know we're running out of time. It sparked a really interesting conversation, and I've gotten some wonderful feedback, and it's helped me. It's helped refine my views. So I uh, I welcome all of it, even the people who say I'm an idiot. 
Yes, I yeah. agree. I agree. It was actually a really interesting thing to follow, and I liked your. I had to. I had to mute it actually, so like I'm not paying attention <laughs> to the responses anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny i totally yeah. get it <laughs> sometimes you're just like i'm over this conversation uh, i mean i'm not but it's like <laughs> i'm not i have like 12 hours of work to do like i didn't do any work responding one day and the next day i had to work until like midnight so like, oh uh, yeah yeah that's yeah, actually why i don't cool. spend a lot of time on twitter because I, I have other stuff i have to do so anyway all right well it's been so great having you on the show thanks for coming on unconfirmed thank you so much that was a ton of fun Okay, now it's time for everyone's favorite news recap. First headline, in-depth, China's soon-to-launch national blockchain platform. Lots of blockchain news out of China this week. China's Blockchain Service Network, or BNS, launched domestically on Wednesday and is set to launch globally on April 25th. It is designed to make it easy for companies and software developers to plug and play to build blockchain applications. Coindesk quotes James Cooper, a law professor at California Western School of Law, who says, quote, The move is very much like the One Belt, One Road initiative, in which China provides other countries with infrastructure and gains some first mover advantage. Coindesk also says the BSN is not a blockchain protocol, but, quote, a centralized platform that has done the hefty living for, lifting for developers so they can plug in and code, choosing from several enterprise blockchain protocols or public chains. The goal is to reduce their operational costs, improve flexibility, and provide better regulatory oversight, according to the white paper. So far, the permissioned blockchain protocols included our Hyperledger, Baidu's Superchain and Fisco, which is from a consortium of China's Shenzhen government agencies and local tech companies, such as Tencent, WeBank, and Huawei. The white paper says that the BSN will also include public, public blockchains, Ethereum, and EOS. Next headline, DCEP wallet application revealed. Screenshots from a test of a DCEP wallet application from the Agricultural Bank of China made the rounds on Twitter this week. In a tweet storm, last week's unconfirmed guest, Matthew Graham, said that it shows the four test cities, which are Shenzhen, Shang'an, Chengdu, and Suzhou, which he called Tier 1 or Tier 2 cities that are home to tech talent. One especially notable feature is touch-slash-offline payment which enables users to transact via near-field communication, or NFC, when users are offline. He also notes that the system for issuing DCEP follows a two-tier system, in which the People's Bank of China connects to commercial banks and other financial intermediaries, which in turn connect with retail customers. The issuance of cash as, as DCEP is more like a conversion event, and that is a bottom-up approach he says, quote, starting from the user's own bank wallet as opposed to top-down from the PBOC. Molly from Hashkey wrote a tweet storm about it and said, quote, if China decides to fully regulate the crypto exchanges, using DCEP might become the only, well, oh, <laughs> only way to buy or sell crypto to fiat. Next headline, Libra reissues white paper as single currency stablecoins. While China's central bank digital currency plans get underway, Libra is retooling to create a handful of stablecoins tied to the U.S. dollar, euro, British pound, and Singapore dollar. It will still issue the Libra token, but that is now becoming a smart contract that aggregates these single currency stablecoins. The approach is similar to the IMF's Special Drawing Rights, or SDR. The system, which they initially said would begin permissioned but over time transition to permissionless, will now instead move to what David Marcus, the head of Libra, or Calibra actually at Facebook, described in a tweet as, quote, a market-driven open and competitive network, one in which the participants will always remain known to each other. As for what people think of the changes, one Silicon Valley investor told Coindesk, Governments could be interested in outsourcing the transition of their currencies to digital to an organization like Libra, but he'd questioned whether or not partners will remain interested in a project whose business model features such low returns. Next headline, 
The Financial Stability Board advises G20 regulators about the risks of global stablecoins. The Financial Stability Board, or FSB, which advises the G20 on how to improve the global financial system, published a report on the risks posed by global stablecoins such as Libra. It said, quote, If users relied upon a stablecoin to make regular payments, significant operational disruptions could quickly affect real economic activity. Large-scale flows of funds into or out of the GSC, global stablecoin, could test the ability of the supporting infrastructure to handle high transaction volumes and the financing, financing conditions of the wider financial system. Next headline, Ethereum Milestone. Value transfer reaches parity with Bitcoin. Meanwhile, the rise of stablecoins has helped fuel activity on Ethereum to the point where value transfer on Ethereum is now equal to that on Bitcoin, Masari reports. In a tweet storm, Masari's Ryan Watkins said this was driven by the fact that Q1 was the best quarter ever for stablecoins, due in part to the flight to safety caused by the coronavirus pandemic. He tweeted, quote, The action this quarter was so dramatic, it shook the prevailing order in cryptocurrencies. Ethereum is becoming the dominant value transfer layer in crypto. That See, he has three bullet points, and that was the first one. Tether cracked the top three cryptocurrencies by market cap, and stablecoin challengers have gained serious momentum. He also tweeted, stablecoins now account for 80% of daily transfer value on Ethereum, and they're used for significantly larger transfers on average than Bitcoin. Super interesting stuff. All right, next headline. Grayscale reports largest quarterly inflows. In Q1 of 2020, Grayscale Investments raised $504 million with the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, GBTC, garnering the most investment at $389 million. Institutions such as hedge funds, crypto native investors, and family offices constitute 90% of the inflows since inception. On a related note, the Financial Times reports that Andreessen Horowitz is raising a second fund for a 16Z crypto, and they are eyeing a $450 million raise. All right, time for fun bits. I have two fun bits this week. The first is human IPOs. Is this going to be a thing? This week, crypto entrepreneur Alex Mazmesh, and if he's listening, excuse me if I just mingled your name, I hope not. Alex announced that he'd sold $20,000 worth of personal tokens called, you guessed it, Alex, to 29 participants. Alex holders will receive 15% of his income in the next three years, capped at $100,000, plus they receive one-on-one -on -one sessions with Mazmesh, access to his network, and possible participation in the seed round of his next startup. He's going to work on building a new DeFi savings startup. The $20,000 will fund his relocation from Paris to San Francisco. So am I the only one who heard this and immediately whipped out the calculator to figure out how the hell the math works out for him on this? Because either he's underestimating how far the $20,000 will go in San Francisco, or his idea of how much money he's going to make is kind of low. Um, but then also on top of all that, he has these Kickstarter-like bonuses he's going to give out, some of which are time-consuming. And as we all know, time is the most precious resource. So maybe I'm wrong. Uh, we'll see, I guess. Um, yeah, we'll just have to wait to see how this pans out. All right, second fun bits. Another crypto community coronavirus effort, covid -athon. Last week, I mentioned some crypto community efforts to fight COVID-19, and I forgot to mention one called COVIDathon, which is a hackathon working on building privacy-centric solutions for COVID-19 using AI and blockchain technologies. It's put on by the Decentralized AI Alliance under the leadership of Singularity Net and Ocean Protocol. The first phase runs until April 30th, which is the deadline to submit. So if you have an idea, you still have a bit less than two weeks to do so. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Stephen and the blog, be sure to check the links in the show notes of your podcast player. All crypto, no hype, some merch. Shop Unchained t-shirts, hats, mugs, and stickers at shop.unchainedpodcast.com. Again, that's shop.unchainedpodcast.com. 
Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Fractal Recording, Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, Josh Durham, and the team at CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening.